welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, today we'll be presenting episode six, Making the Code Part of Software Preservation Culture. My name is Jessica Meyerson, and I'm community advisor to the Software Preservation Network and research program officer at Educopia Institute. Uh, today's episode is the continuation of our seven-part series of webinars exploring the Fair Use Code and other legal tools for software preservation. This is co-hosted by the Association of Research Libraries and the Software Preservation Network. So just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, we ask all but the hosts and the guests to be muted throughout the webinar, um, ex except in Q&A, and we'll cue you for that period of time, just to maximize the audiovisual quality of the recording. If you have any questions during the presentation, we ask and encourage you type them into the chat box, the Zoom chat box, which you can find in your control panel in the Zoom interface. And then I'll bring these up again uh, during the Q&A section of the presentation, and we will have time for questions for our guests and facilitators. Every episode will be recorded, transcribed, and posted to the SPIN website. You all can uh, keep a lookout for announcements about the entire series being posted in the, in the next couple of weeks. And then today's discussion takes place with members of the Code of Best Practices research team, which I'll name uh, shortly, and our esteemed guests, which include uh, Lindsay Wiramuni is the Manager of Intellectual Property for MIT's Office of Digital Learning, a department of MIT Open Learning. Uh, Wiramuni oversees and implements copyright policy for the MIT Open Courseware and MIT X. MIT Open Courseware is a web-based publication of virtually all MIT courses and is available under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share-Alike License. Um, MIT X offers MOOCs in a variety of subjects. And Wiramuni was the project director for the Code of Best Practices for Fair Use for Open Courseware. She often presents at conferences on open educational resources, copyright, and online learning. Um, and you can read more about Wiramuni's experience with fair use and MIT Open Courseware in the article how to fight fair use fear, uncertainty, and doubt, the experience of one open educational resource. Um, and we'll make sure that that link is included with the final posting uh, of the recording. We also have with us today, Gordon Quinn, who's artistic director and founding member of Cardam Quinn Films and has been making documentaries for 50 years. A longtime activist for public and community media, Quinn was integral to the creation of ITVS, Public Access Television in Chicago, the documentary filmmaker statement of best practice and fair use, and informed the Indie Caucus to hold PBS accountable. With Cardam Quinn, Gordon has created a legacy that inspires young filmmakers and provides a unique structure for the collaborative creation of high quality social issue documentaries. And your research lead and facilitators for today's episode include Patricia Ofterheide, University Professor, School of Communication, and founder of the Center for Media and Social Impact at American University. Patricia is one of the originators of the Fair Use Best Practices Movement and is co-author of the Software Preservation Code of Best Practices. And Peter Yazzie of American University, as well as Krista Cox of Association of Research Libraries, are two members of the Code of Best Practices for Software Preservation Research Team that we're joined uh, with today and by today. So in this fifth episode, Pat, Gordon, and Lindsay will discuss the difference between a document and a shift in software preservation practice, how other communities have incorporated fair use into their professional practice, and how to talk to gatekeepers and to allies in your network to strengthen field-wide practice. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Pat. Wonderful. I, I would love my first slide, actually my second slide. Because what I'd like to do with you guys today um, is, first of all, to review where we're going. Uh, so, what we're going to, what we, how we hope to spend our time today is actually to spend the most valuable part of it uh, with you in what would usually be a Q and A. And um, so, first of all, we're going to talk about why creating the document itself uh, doesn't doesn't get to the goal, although it's the sine qua non. And then second, ways in which the community can uh, make this code available to uh, people who can use it. We're going to hear from Gordon Quinn about how documentarians did that. And we're gonna hear from Lindsay Wiramuni about uh, 
how the people in the open courseware community did that. We're going to talk about the uh, the efforts that we have begun to uh, disseminate the word in the software preservation community so far. And then we're going to get to the really good part, which is what do you think we should be doing? Thanks. Next slide. And this is where I turn it over to Peter Yassi, uh, who's going to talk about uh, why isn't the code enough? And I think you have to unmute yourself, Peter. And we're not hearing you. The answer to your question, Pat, why the code or why isn't the code enough in itself really lies in the nature of this and of the other codes that it is a, a family to which it has family relations and about which you'll be hearing a little more soon. These codes are relatively high level documents that re represent strong consensus in the field and they are legally vetted and we think and time has, has tended to show highly reliable, but they don't publicize themselves. They, we, we can do so much in terms of, of, of putting them together and putting them online, but then acceptance becomes an issue. And that's why it is crucial that opinion leaders and communities that are affected by copyright and then see some utility of in these codes should take a role themselves in spreading the word. There are a lot of ways of doing that and I think that some of those are our, our topic for today. Mm -hmm. the, the difficulty is compounded by the fact that if, if one only had to convince the line practitioners in a given field that fair use was a robust and reliable friend, that might be possible in a fairly straightforward way. But of course, although the line practitioners themselves have doubts accumulated over time as a result of, of, of exposure to the permissions culture and in, in sort of um, sort of ingrained as 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 a function of of the the kind of professional network of of beliefs some valid and some mistaken about copyright there are others as well who play an important role uh, and the 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 line practitioner it, it often understands very well that although relying on fair use may entail some level of legal risk not doing so not taking advantage of the rights that the law offers produces an even greater risk of of, of uh, an even greater level of what might be called mission risk the possibility that by not exercising one's rights, one will end up not doing the job. Again, if we had had only line practitioners to convince, that might be fairly straightforward, but there are others in the system as well. Direct and supervisors, uh, supervisors of supervisors and other kinds of gatekeepers in the system everybody up to it, including under some case, in some cases, university or, or museum administrators and general counsel, they have to be persuaded as well. So it's a complex task. Uh, thank you. Um, so if we um, move to the next slide, we can see that there are some typical first steps that people take. Uh, one of the first things, of course, when we create codes of best practices with communities, we do it through membership organizations, such as um, the uh, Association of Research Libraries. And I believe that Krista Cox from the ARL is, is on this call. Um, 
Uh, but endorsements are absolutely critical from other institutions that people rely on because what we're looking for is legitimacy. So we we go to um, we go to the other organizations in the field that people trust. Something else we do is is either write ourselves or get other people to write articles in places that that circulate this information in a trusted way. Sometimes it's a listserv, sometimes it's a blog or a magazine. I recall when we released the very first code, which was the Documentary Filmmakers Code, we were just delirious with happiness because Sundance is the big, big event there, and we were able to get articles in every major film magazine that was present at the festival. So you just couldn't avoid us. Um, we uh, often uh, give presentations at conferences, either the people who coordinated it or people who are leaders uh, from the community who've been involved. Uh, and we are proud to have done extended interviews with 41 leaders in this community already who we're hoping to draw on uh, more, but we know that we're also talking to other ones on this call. Uh, and finally, we've had conversations and meetings with both opinion leaders and uh, leading related associations. In the case of the documentary filmmakers, for instance, it was insurance brokers. So those are some of the things we think about, and I'd love for you to be thinking about um, connections in your field, because we're going to turn to you at the end of this. And now I'm going to turn it over to Gordon Quinn, uh, who is going to talk about what happened um, uh, to make the code so widely known in the field um, uh, when uh, in the years after it was released. And next slide, please, and Gordon. So, you know, we, we had the good fortune, and I, I think this happened with many of the codes, is that our field really participated in the writing of it. Uh, we hosted a couple meetings here at Cartemplin, Pat and Peter came in, and so by the time it was published, the field was sort of on board with it, or a lot of people in our field, the, the, the practitioners, the people who would be using it, were pretty familiar with what we were talking about. But now the challenge was to deal with the gatekeepers, uh, the lawyers, and the insurance companies. And, you know, I, I sometimes say that five-year period after we published it, I never talked to so many lawyers in my life. We went to conferences. I was at some with Pat. I was at some with Peter and with other lawyers. Uh, I remember once uh, going to Lake Placid, I think, with Peter, and we were presenting to 500 in leading intellectual property lawyers from all over the country. And there was a huge education that had to be done with these people. They all thought they knew it. Uh, you, we were dealing with a, a, an industry in which you know they would say, no, 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 it's right here in, the, in our NBC standards and practices uh, code, you know, the 30 second rule, you can you, you lose 30 seconds or no more. And we would have to educate them about the law and about what we were doing. We had really effective uh, presentations at uh, associations of university teachers. I remember the first time we presented, and I think it was here in, in Chicago, I think it was the UFVA, and a bunch of us were on the panel. It was Pat and Peter, and I think Michael uh, Donaldson, and myself, and the room was too small. There were literally people trying to just get their head in the room to hear our presentation. So there was a sort of, out there on in certain parts of the field, there was that unease sense that they didn't quite have this right. But we were pushing against uh, what Pat and Peter called the clearance culture, which is that, you know, 50 years ago when I was making documentaries, we didn't really understand what fair use was, but somehow in our gut, we thought we had these rights. And as we became more successful, as we started to be broadcast, as we started to get into theaters and, and create uh, contracts with distribution companies, we ran into the clearance culture where everyone was saying no. I mean, basically what people were being taught in school was to be a professional in our field of documentary filmmaking, everything in your movie has to be clear. That's what people were being taught. 
Uh, and that's what some of these uh, gatekeepers uh, were, you know, were demanding. So little by little, we were changing the opinion. Sometimes it would be at a conference. I re for a period, I went to about probably in the city of Chicago. I don't think I ever traveled for one of these to these, uh, I think they call them CLE. It's that thing, continuing education for lawyers. And I would, it would be a lunchtime presentation in a law firm. I'd get a free lunch out of it. And they're all getting paid to be there. But I'd make a presentation on fair use uh, over lunch. And little by little, we just sort of were re educating all of these critical people. One of the most important, and you know, I was less involved with the broadcasters, except for PBS, and PBS was the first gatekeeper who finally said, okay, we will accept your fair use claims, we will broadcast it, even though we, at that point we could not get insurance on the fair use claims. And the big breakthrough in our field was when uh, some people behind the scenes, I think Pat and Peter were involved in that, had been meeting with the insurance companies and one insurance company said, okay, we will, uh, you know, we will insure, insure your, your fair use claims. I, I think one of the things that was really important with how we carried on this education process was we would always begin with sort of some fundamental principles about fair use and try to make them understand we are, it's about a balance. We're not saying everything's okay. We are in fact rights holders. We're very concerned about piracy and other issues. So you have to understand that what we're looking for and what we in our field were trying to put forth was a balance of conflicting rights based on what was already in the law. And that I think helped us to kind of get people to back up a little bit and start thinking about, you know, rather than just going to, like we know this, I'm a lawyer and I've given thousands of opinions on this, to take it back to the first principles and the philosophical arguments behind it to get them to kind of go down the path of how the law really should be uh, interpreted. And we were enormously successful. Uh, it changed everything in our field. Virtually, certainly every documentary we do and most documentaries that you see today have some fair use in it. Uh, you know, of course, the, and the one other detail, and then I'll, I'll stop, is that by the time we were doing all this education, we had arranged with some law clinics uh, and people to so that we could say to our own field, if you stay within these guidelines, you're not going to get sued, but it is you are asserting your rights. So there's always that vulnerability. And we had law clinics lined up that would defend people if, if they ever did get sued. Uh, the important thing I think that we understood by the time we were doing this and working with, with lawyers like Peter was that, that the, the case law really supported our position of fair use. And these big companies that had been threatening us for years with these cease and desist letters, threatening to sue, and people would, you know, they fold. You can't stand up to Sony, and if Sony reaches out to your broadcaster, you're then dead in the water. But the fact is they didn't actually sue because they had lawyers in this area who didn't want to get a bad precedent and a bad court decision. And so, you know, we, once we got organized as a field and stood up for our rights and went through this process of educating all these different kinds of people that Pat was laying out, we really turned the tide. Oh, terrific. Um... Thank you, Gordon. Anything else, or shall we, are we ready for Lindsay? I think that's it for me. Okie doke. Then, Lindsay, if you unmute, there we go. We're ready for you. And next slide, please. Hi. Um, so I had the privilege of working with Pat and Peter starting in 2009, because we were inspired by the filmmakers code of best practice. And one day I looked at my boss and I said, look at this really cool thing. Um, because one of my coworkers had the code sitting on his desk and he said, Hey, look, have you ever seen this? 
and I borrowed it for an afternoon and I read it and I said, well, why can't we have one? Um, because they can do all these really cool things with it. So this was just before um, a conference that we go to every year for open education. And the thing that combines all the people together at um, the open education conference is that they publish under an open license educational materials online. And for those of you who don't know, that usually means Creative Commons or uh, GNU licenses or other things like that. So I sort of had um, an informal session with the members of other schools in the US and I said, how would you feel about getting together to collaborate on a fair use code for us in the US just like the filmmakers one and they all sort of said okay sounds good to me what do we need to do and I said well I'll find out um, and I looked at the back of the filmmakers code and I got in touch with Pat and it all took off from there um, so a year later we had the code published it took a lot of work but it was so worth it um, and I can tell you some of the lessons learned, the ups and downs, once I brought it back to MIT to get it implemented. Um, the first thing that's really important for you to um, take into consideration is that having the support of your Office of General Counsel to the work on the code that you're doing is so vital to your success. If it takes no matter what it takes, you should work really hard to persuade them, on, you know, unless they're already on board with this kind of thing. If they need, if you need ammunition to help them understand, just go to the open courseware sites that live on Pat's website and, you know, point to all of the successes and the different codes that exist already. Um, and it's all over the culture and creators um, field already. So we're all doing great stuff with open court, uh, excuse me, with fair use. And we have been since 2005. Um, so when I brought the code back to my office to train people, um, there was so much fear, uncertainty and doubt, like the FUD amongst my colleagues was huge. They were very scared and very nervous um, and like they wanted no questions about does this mean we're going to get sued now? Does this cover every kind of content that we have in our courses or things like that? Because professors who publish courses put film clips in their lectures or you know, all the little image snippets that come from textbooks, or I just got this off the web, I don't know where it came from, all that kind of stuff. Um, and at the same time, they were eager and willing to learn. So it was this tension between fear and excitement. Um, and so the training took place across two or three training sessions. And the last half hour of each training session was for questions. And that's an important component when you train a group of people because the questions will be um, excessive. Now, after the training, I always said, you know, come to me with any doubts or any questions or anything at all. I am not an expert, but if I don't know the answer, I will go to my expert people and I will try to figure it out um, and we'll figure it out together. So in that way, we learned together and that was a really great lesson to learn bit by bit, the confidence grew and what they learned and what I figured out for them was employing fair use, implementing fair use is like a muscle. The more you consider whether you can use it or not, the easier it gets, the easier the judgment calls make. 
and um, that's an important component. The other lesson that we learned was um, watch out for copyright holders who don't understand the rights they can use and they can exercise and that um, others can as well. There are folks out there that cling to permission culture uh, as described by Peter before. Um, I'll give you an example. We were challenged a couple of times by copyright holders who were so embedded deeply in, in the permission culture that um, you know, we sent a permission request under our open license in which we never pay for and they sent back an invoice for, you know, you can use it for six months and, and here pay us, you know, a hundred dollars. And I replied with, um, thank you, but your reply does not meet the terms of our use. I will edit our content accordingly, which was code for, we're going to apply fair use here. Um, and they wrote back again saying, can you please explain what edit means? And I replied with, um, well, we're going to turn to our code of best practices of fair use and blah, blah, like there was this back and forth. And the reply was something like this long jargony letter about, if you consider using fair use in the future, please consult with us so that we may judge whether it's fair use. And then I banged my head a few times <laughs> and got a good, had a good laugh with our IP lawyers. And I, you know, that was just, that was for LARFs. Um, but we were able to challenge off, I would say four or five challenges to us like that with the help of our code. And that was because we had the strength of our community and we had a document to point to. Um, the one piece of content that I am most proud of is in a film studies class where we felt before we had the code, we published it in 2007 with just print lecture notes. And the professor was extremely unhappy. And our users were extremely unhappy. Um, and then we had the code. We published the lecture notes with the clips in full, unedited. And at the end of each end slate that we add, that we add to credit all the content that's in these lecture notes, we put a, our usual content statement that says, some content appears courtesy of their content holders and is not covered by our open courseware license, all rights reserved. So it's understood that these bits have copyright holders that are not ours and they're not covered. And if anybody has a question, they can go to our FAQ about fair use that our lawyers helped us write. So we feel covered from head to toe <laughs> and, uh, and it's never failed us since it came out and we're really, really proud of it. Thanks. So thanks so much to you both. I think one of the things that's been so interesting to me about Oh, next slide, please. Um, about both of these initiatives, and in fact, all of the initiatives, is that we just don't see real pushback from uh, copyright holders. We see copyright holders getting educated sometimes, but uh, we haven't seen what people probably most fear, which is people getting in trouble. Um, so I really appreciate those stories. People like Gordon and people like Lindsay, they're, they're, they're leaders in their communities and it matters uh, tremendously that they, that they did this work. Uh, the other thing that I think so um, moves me is, is what Lindsay said about the more you do it, the easier it gets. Mm -hmm. Because that means that the people on this call um, are going to have to be the most courageous. And everybody who comes after them starts treating it as normal. 
Uh, I recently hosted a young filmmaker who made a magnificent, a magnificent film called Valentine Road, which is just chock full of all this um, uh, news material. And I said to her, um, what did, how did you deal with all that material? And she said, oh, I, I just fear used it. I was like, oh, that's awesome. You know, um, I was part of the team that created the Code of Best Practices. And she said, huh. <laughs> and it, I was so thrilled because like it was totally history to her and mm -hmm. for her this was just like this is what you do and that that's where I'm, I'm really hoping the software preservation community gets to just wanted to let you know where we've gotten to so far because even though we're at the very first stages I think there's some some real good uh, activity that's been done as you can see on this slide the the signatories who've endorse this code and come in strong saying we are going to promote it and these these are all organizations that have through their own uh, networks already begun to spread the word uh, this is besides the lead organization the Amer uh, uh, Association of Research Libraries and of course uh, Peter's uh, center at uh, the law school, my center at the School of Communication at American University have also done some, some work. But these, these signatory endorsing organizations of the field itself are very important. Uh, we've also been presenting at um, conferences that pull together people like you. Um, I want you to take a good look at that conference list because we need more suggestions of other conferences to start making sure we focus on. Of course, this webinar series is part of the, the outreach activity and we hope that once it's transcribed and all of the uh, episodes are recorded that you'll be able to, to go to tell your colleagues about this as a, as a resource for them. And there's also a little explainer video, which you can see on our, my website, which is, you can see the uh, URL right there. And maybe, um, Jessica, if you have a sec, you can put it in chat too. Um, and that is, that is completely fungible. You can move it over to your website anytime you want. And if it makes a difference to put your um, organization's uh, bug on it, please do that. So that's kind of, now, um, Krista, I know you're lurking in there. Did I forget anything? Jessica, Peter, chime in if I, if I missed something here. Certainly nothing missed. Um, one, one further story, I guess, uh, which dates to the period in which we were doing the, or had done really, the Code of Best Practices for Research Libraries, which was a, a pretty big deal. A lot of institutions were involved. And the point that, that, that Lindsay made and, and that Gordon made about the, the role that lawyers play in the process of implementation in institutional settings was borne out on many occasions then as well. And I think we learned something too, which you may all want to think about. As I, as I said earlier, the code is a relatively high level document. It empowers but it doesn't mandate any, any particular set of practices. So every institution has to think about how they are going to use the code, how they're going to translate it into guidance that can be even more straightforward, even easier to follow than the, the, the code itself. Guidance that will give various kinds of line employees, a process for thinking step by step through a fair use decision. One of the things we discovered when we were working with, with schools and their libraries to implement the research libraries code is that it's a really sometimes a very good idea to get your lawyers involved, your institutional lawyers, your associate general counsels or whoever they are, involved in the implementation process to, to, to call on them as helpers rather than treating them as the 
the the audience or ex only as the audience for the for or as an audience for persuasion there was one school where we we got the, the library people in the general council together and and we began talking about how this general code was going to be locally implemented and the lawyers got so enthusiastic that they basically said oh let us do it and they did it all themselves and they did a great job they probably did a bolder and and better job of coming up with implementing uh, guidance than the librarians themselves would have done had we waited had we involved them only at a much later stage, I'm not sure that they would have been as cooperative. Ownership matters, even when you're dealing with gatekeepers. I guess that's all I would, I would say about that experience. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good point, Peter. And all these years later, I, I'm, I can't remember how long ago was we published the documentary filmmaker statement, um, but two weeks ago, a group of producers at the local PBS station said, can you come and talk about fair use at our station? And so I went up there and there's like about 10 producers in the room and, and one of their lawyers is there and working with the clips and you know, we talked through some examples and, and just the fact of doing that, because the lawyer was pretty on top of it. He, he kind of knew what, what you know, he was trying he was there trying to be helpful but by having that discussion even all these years later i could see it strengthened everybody's backbone and that was partly why they wanted me to come up there you know to be saying we've been doing this since the statement was published we've never had a we've never even been threatened over a, a fair use claim uh we've been threatened over other things but not that so, so I, I, I i'm sorry yeah, I, I just think that it's, you know, you have to think of it, yes, you need to exercise it, and the education process is ongoing. So, um, I want to point out that, that Lindsay, oh, Lindsay, you have a point to make, sorry. Hi, um, I just want to, um, Peter, what you said triggered something in my mind. Um, we are not setting policy with these codes. We are creating a best practice. And the mileage varies from institution to institution. So these documents are not legal documents. They are suggestive. And everyone employs them, implements them in a different way. Um, just as fair use, the four factors are not a formula. They are like a roadmap, it's a guideline. And one does not have to meet all four factors to decide whether the use is fair. So, you know, if that's, if that's a albatross around your neck, set it free. <laughs> So thank you. Uh, I'm, I've moved to the next slide because we're we're in the phase of the um, of the webinar that we where we turn to you and Peter. There are a couple of questions from people. I, can you see the chat box? If you can't, I'll read them to you. But in, while in, while you're um, while you're looking, let me uh, get, just take a look at this list of things that you could do to let people know about this and let me know what are we missing here if if you would like to have reassurance more information on this better understand it uh where would you like us to be we actually um have a wee smidge of travel budget and and uh some of our time for the next few months to do this with you after that you're on your own so this is like a great moment to ask us to do things. Um, this, this moment rarely happens where people will, uh, you know, you, you can get other people to do things for you for free. So seize it. Uh, and you could, you could either um, unmute or, or uh, write in your comments. Peter, were you able to access the chat? 
Okay, so I'm gonna tell you there's two questions. One Drew says, let's say that for some reason a copyright holder won a case. What's the worst case scenario for libraries, museums, and archives other than a waste of time preserving the software? The other question is how does uh, this work uh, in international distribution for filmmakers? And I think it, it's possible for you to address those pretty quickly. And I hope that it, when you're at, after you've done that, people are going to tell us how they want to take advantage of our time. And we also have a third question, um, which oh. I can bring up after Peter has the opportunity to address those. Sorry, I didn't see that. Yes, okay. So let me let me let me do them in reverse order and talk about international filmmaking as well, because that allows me to give a little plug for next week's final episode of the webinar, which is going to be about the international implications of the code of best practice. And it's going to talk a little bit about the variation and the way in which national laws around the world deal with copyright limitations and exceptions, and how um, practitioners who have worldwide connections or or are parts of, of global networks can begin to think about navigating that space. In the filmmaking world, it actually turns out to be easier than in most of the, the other fields uh, for two reasons. One is that in most of the rest of the world, uh, the, even, even the even the, the, the idea of litigating about these issues is so foreign that as a practical matter, if problems come up, they're just sort of, they're worked out and negotiated informally. Um, but the other and, and even more potent reason is that in general, when US filmmakers get insurance for their films, which they need to do, if they're going to distribute them as broadly as possible, domestically, that insurance also gives them protection against uh, claims of very uh, copyright related claims worldwide. So it hasn't proved to be a problem in, in particular for filmmakers. I actually think it's a little more complex in other domains such as software preservation, hence our decision to, to, to do a separate topic on it next time. The other question is, how bad could it be? Well, it's a little bit hard to figure out in this how, well, let me back up a little bit. It's a little bit hard to figure out why anyone would ever choose to litigate against a, a software preservation institution, given the, the the very small benefits that they could imagine ever deriving from such litigation. And I, I think both a number of people, including Pat and Gordon, Lindsay, have, have suggested that by and large in the, oh, whatever it is now, um, close to 15 years that we've been doing this stuff, there just haven't been any lawsuits. Um, uh, against people operating within the statement of best practices for filmmakers or within the OER code or within any of the other codes. So it's kind of hard to speculate. I don't think it's going to happen in all likelihood. But if it did, then I suppose that the worst case is first, as described, that you, you might lose your work you might be subject to an injunction, I suppose. I'm making this up. It seems so unlikely that would require you to take material down. And I suppose that some kind of nominal damage award, you know, symbolic rather than real, is also possible. But we talked about this a little bit earlier on. And, and I said then what I want to repeat now, and that is that that, that, that by and large, because the only benefits that flow from the software preservation work are diffuse, non-monetizable non public benefits, there just isn't any, any basis on which a, a really 
sort of strong damage award could be could be premised. So I think the exposure is rather low. I, and I think if passes for a law, which is certainly is ever sure, but if, if it turns out that history is a guide, I also don't think the risk of that worst case is appreciable. Peter, could you, uh, in, the, in our field, I know, there is also an international treaty. And if I understand it correctly, and, and when I speak in other countries, I say, look, your country's, your democracy, you must have some version of fair use, but your law may be different from our law. Yeah. But there is this treaty so that when we broadcast a film, and this is, I think, why we can get the insurance, basically, all the signatories of that treaty are saying, well, if it flew in your country, then we'll accept it too. Something, some version of that. I, it's some version of that. I think that's right. I don't know whether I would go so far as to say that, that it was mandated by treaty, but I think the broad understanding is that the, the, the law that really counts, especially in the case of, 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 for instance, let's say internet distribution, that the law that really counts the most is the law of the source country. I'll talk yeah. about this a little more next week. And happily for us, in the case of, of software preservation projects, even those with global reach, the ones we're most concerned about are the ones that have the US, the, the home of fair use as the, the source country jurisdiction. So I think that's right. It looks like Victoria is asking uh, in a slightly, maybe a slightly different direction from the previous two questions, but, but certainly just as important, is thinking about how to reach out to different audiences that are doing this practice in different contexts. So what are some of the challenges in reaching out to either filmmakers, software archivists, or even online content creators that are outside the academic or association here? That's a great question, Victoria. Can I ask um, for clarification on reaching out to what end? What is the goal for the outreach? Yeah, Victoria, is that to inform and to make sure that cultural heritage institutions outside of those two spheres are still able to apply the code? Oh, um, well, I just would share the resources that are online um, and share the anecdotal experiences and successes that we have had. Um, I would share the successes that other fair use practitioners and uh, the, the awareness that I have about codes that have been, it, been implemented that I have known about. I would just, I just talk it up, you know, yeah. um, and remind them that fair use is for everybody. Yeah, and, and generally you will find, I think, you know, the bigger the institution, uh, the more effort you have to put in to changing your thinking. And I think it probably varies from field to field. We're independent, uh, not for profit. And Peter knows to this day, I come to him for our fair use letters so that we can get insurance. And the reason that I do that is that our own lawyers are too conservative to actually give me the letter. They're a big international firm. They do a lot of pro bono work for us. And they're like, you know, yes, we agree with you. I understand it. I've been on panels with the guy, but he can't bring himself to actually write the letter. Wow. And, you know, and, and I will say to him, he said, well, there is some risk. I said, we're in a risky business. We're documentary filmmakers. Compared <laughs> to all the other risks that I take, this is irrelevant, yeah. you know. But so it's, you know, and I have noticed that sometimes with universities and places like that too. Uh, I'll just give you a quick anecdote because uh, you're on from MIT. Uh, it, uh, Pat and I were on this panel, I think, maybe it was like 15 years ago. It was when we first published the statement. And someone in the audience, and I think it relates to this online, you know, professors, courses and things. Open courseware. 
Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah what, what Lindsay does, yes. Yeah, and so do you remember this, Pat? Somebody asked, they said, well, we have this problem. We filled all these interviews with these professors and the university is saying, we can't use them, we can't put them online because what's in the background behind professors? It's like a shelf of books and those books have titles. Mm. And the university is telling us because it's a uh, trademark title, we can't put it online. And we were just like flabbergasted. You know? <laughs> so, but that I, think, was just, I think Lindsay's been hard at work changing that stuff. Yeah, I think that was, that was a long time ago. That but was, it was before I was on board. Yeah, it, it, was, <laughs> it, it was just amazing. But uh, yeah, there's, I'm, I'm sorry, Lindsay, go ahead. Uh, forgot what I was going to say. Well, so I think, I think what well, you think, let me jump in for a second and, and address the question. And that is uh, the, the software preservation of co code is, of course, designed for institutional users, for, for collections rather than individuals operating as individuals. But it's designed for institutions of every kind and size and variety, that's a very broad definition. And so I think part of the answer to the question of how you get the word out is you think about what the affinity organizations are. What, what places do people, even very small entities that do this work, go uh, along with their, their big university-based counterparts? And you think about what meetings people from across the field attend. And you think about what informal networks, what list servers, what, what other webs of connection may exist among and between practitioners, even though they aren't necessarily visible about outside the field. And you spread the word using all, any and all of the above. I just remembered. Um, when you're talking about risk, oh, first of all, all of those lawyers that you referred to, Gordon, they're gone now. <laughs> Which is part of the Good reason work. why we um, were so successful in getting their <laughs> endorsement for this, the code we have now, the OGC's endorsement. MIT has great lawyers now. Awesome. Um, the When you're taking into consideration levels of risk, risk never goes away. You just have to determine what level of risk is right for you. And we make that call, especially around fair use all the time, um, because you have to remember, sometimes fair use is not appropriate. It's not the right call. Um, and if it's not, it might be because it's too risky. It might be because, you know, the pendulum weighs against the argument for it, it for, for whatever reason, um, or that the risk is just too big. You know, when we're making copyright decisions about our third party content all the time, we can leave something in because it's a fair use use. And we think the risk is really, really low. All of the clips in that film studies course are extremely low risk to keep in there. I would have pulled my hair out for that lawyer who said that thing about the books on the shelf. <laughs> what? That's crazy town. Yeah. Um, but like that's an example of low risk. And that lawyer should be ashamed of themselves and go back to law school. Anyway, rant. And and I would just add one thing. That's such an important point that Lindsay has made. And it's a, what I want to suggest is a kind of a process issue. And it, it's one that comes up sometimes when you are dealing with, inter, not, not with spreading the, world, the word out through the world, but internally with trying to persuade various levels of gatekeepers that they should pay attention. And that is that, of course, the final decisions use or not to use are going to be in involve risk considerations and 
I think there are, I just have two caveats I want to offer. One is that, and this is especially true talking to lawyers and administrators, I adverted to it before, you have to remember to point out to people that there are risks both ways. That there are some risks of doing things, but then there are also risks of not doing things, that you won't fulfill mission, that you won't make the film you want to make, that you won't um, accomplish the, the, the tremendously important goals of MIT OpenCourseWare, or that you won't manage to preserve some rare and fragile old business software program that the world is going to need 20 years from now. So there are risks on both sides. It's just that one set of risks you can you can sort of imagine in in monetized terms, maybe even though sometimes I think those imaginations are 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 more fantasy than real. And then there's another set of risks which which are 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 externalities in effect and, and don't don't respond to monetization, but they both count. That's my one point. My other point about combining thinking about risk with thinking about fair use is that I think there is a, an important sequencing issue. Somebody, sometimes you run into people who say, oh, well, this is just all about risk. It's nothing but risk. So let's just forget about talking about whether something is or isn't fair use and go right to the risk uh, risk analysis, and because after all, at the end of the day, the risk analysis is going to be important. I am very reluctant to do that, and I'm reluctant to, to, to encourage others to do it, because it's better, in my view, to do this in two stages, to say, okay, let's figure out what our rights are here. Fair use is a right. There's a big consensus about what it is in our field. We should be able to figure out how strong our position is, how well within what we think our rights are, we actually are positioned. And then you can think about risk. And you can think more productively, more sensibly, and often I think more liberal-mindedly about risk if you've done the legal analysis first. So I'm very much in favor of breaking it down into a two-step process. Let's apply the code. Let's figure out where we are. Let's talk to our in-house lawyers about the legal issues if we have to. And then, then we'll, we'll think about our risk-based judgments. Thank you so much, Peter. And thank you so much to Pat and to Lindsay and to Gordon for joining us today. I feel especially empowered after today's episode. <laughs> um, it's clear that there's a lot of work that we can do that's entirely tractable. And it really is about um, that, that shared sense of ownership and asserting those user rights. So uh, the conversation continues as far as the software preservation community, most certainly. And um, we will follow up. I just want to reiterate on the previous slide that Pat said to look out for a survey that will be coming after uh, next week's final, seventh and final episode of the webinar series. And we encourage all of you to please respond to that survey so that we have more information in terms of the research team and the Software Preservation Network about how we can get all of you engaged and empowered to apply the code and to educate your colleagues to apply the code. So with that, I'll say join us next week, same time, same place, for our seventh and final episode in this series, uh, International Implications, as Peter mentioned before. This will be featuring Ariel Katz from University of Toronto and possibly another special guest that we have lined up for you. Uh, next week's episode will be facilitated by Peter Yazzi of the Washington School of Law at American University. Thank you all, as always, for joining us today, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Yep.